Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Museum Munchkins. I'm Mr. Nick, and today we are learning all about pteranodons, ancient animals that used to fly around our planet during the time called the Mesozoic. And we're going to start off by singing a song about a pteranodon today. If you want to stand up on your feet and dance and sing along with us. So this song is called Five Big Pteranodon. So we're going to be counting in this song from five all the way back down to zero um, while we do this song. And we're going to learn some hand motions or some whole body motions if you want them to be um, while we sing this song. So we're going to sing the first verse together really slowly so we can learn some motions to go along with our song and then we'll pick up the speed a little bit while we you guys do the motions at home by yourselves and I sing along. Are you ready to learn the song? Great! So this song goes like this. Five big pteranodon. So can we hold up a number five on our hand like this? Because there's five of them flying o'er the ocean on. So we're going to hold out our wings like this, like we're flying around over the ocean. Long wings looking for some fish. Yum, yum. So we're going to look for fish and then rub our bellies like this when we see some yum, yum, because we're hungry pteranodons. One dove beneath the waves. So we for that, for diving, we can put our hands together like this and whoosh, like we're diving into some water. So they could catch their prey. So we're going to use our hands to pretend like we're grabbing something. And now there are four pteranodons. So there's only four now, so we'll hold up four fingers. Do you think that you can do those motions along with us? All right, let's see if you can try. We'll go slowly to start again. Are you ready? Four big pteranodons flying o'er the ocean on long wings looking for some fish yum yum one dove beneath the waves so they could catch their prey now there are three pteranodons can you hold up your number three very good three big pteranodons flying o'er the ocean on long wings looking for some fish yum yum one dove beneath the waves so they could catch their prey now there are two pteranodons how many are left two two big pteranodons flying o'er the ocean on long wings looking for some fish yum yum one dove beneath the waves so they could catch their prey now there is one pteranodon just one big pteranodon left let's pretend this one pteranodon that's left is the biggest one of all so can we get really big and one big pteranodon flying o'er the ocean on long wings looking for some fish. Yum, yum. One dove beneath the waves so they could catch their prey. And now there are no pteranodons. Very good. Thanks for singing that song along with me. I'm going to set my guitar down so that we can talk all about pteranodons. So have you ever seen or heard of a pteranodon before? Maybe you have. So a pteranodon is an animal that looks a little bit like this. In fact, it looks just like this. So pteranodons are a type of animal called a pterosaur, a flying reptile that lived on our planet a long, long, long time ago. And they had wings 
that were made from skin and their hands. So there was skin that connected their hands and their arms to their body, and that's what made their wings. So they had four fingers on each of their hands. Can you hold up one of your hands? How many fingers do you have on your hand? Can you help me count the fingers on my hand? I have one, two, three, four, five fingers on my hand. So I have one more finger than a pteranodon or another pterosaurs have. So they only had four fingers on each of their hand. And so they had three fingers in the middle of their arm, in the middle of their hand, like that they would grab things with or maybe uh, scratch at things with. And then the most of their, their wing was made with just their one finger, their ring finger, which was very, very, very long. Can you imagine if you hold out your arms? Can you hold out your arms as far as they will go? And now imagine that your arms are twice as long just because of your ring finger. Because it, if your ring finger grew to be the same length as your whole rest of your arm. So they had a really, really long finger that made up the rest of their wing. And their bodies were covered in a substance. Kind of like hair. Not quite hair though. And not quite feathers either. And they were called pycnofibers. Can you say that word with me? That's a fun kind of a fun word to say. Pycnofibers. So it kind of like sounds like someone telling us to pick no fibers. So don't pick up any of those fibers. And that's what their bodies were covered with. So kind of like a hairy substance, but it wasn't actually hair like we have or like other animals have. And pteranodons and other pterosaurs were not dinosaurs, even though they lived at the same time as a lot of dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. They weren't dinosaurs. They're related to dinosaurs because both of those animals are reptiles, but they're their own group of animals, not dinosaurs. So sometimes people get a little bit confused about animals when we think about them that lived so, so long ago. And that's part of my job here at the museum is to help teach people about the differences between all these amazing different animals that used to and still do live on our planet. Now, Pteranodon was first found in the year 1870. That's about 150 million years ago, or 150 years ago. In fact, that's 150 years ago this year. This summer is the anniversary, the 150th anniversary of the first discovery of Pteranodon way back in 1870 in the state of Kansas. Because uh, and pteranodons are only found here in the United States. So if I grab my globe here, and I'll get a little bit closer so we can see. So pteranodon is only found here in the central sort of western United States. So here's Kansas, and that's where the very first pteranodon was found. We don't find them up into Canada or down into Mexico. We only find them here in the United States and North America. And they lived at a time when, right now we can see, here's the Gulf of Mexico down here. There's lots of water over here and the Atlantic Ocean. And way up here by the North Pole is the Arctic Ocean. Well, when Pteranodon was around, the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic Ocean were actually connected to each other. There was an ocean in the middle of the United States. And that's where we find a lot of our pteranodon fossils. It was a place called the Western Interior Seaway, and it's all dried up now. There's no ocean in the middle of the United States now, but a long, long time ago, millions of years ago, when pteranodon was around, there was an ocean, which I think is pretty cool. Now, pteranodons were pretty big animals, even though they were only about four feet tall, so only they would only come up to about here on me, about four to five feet tall. They had wings that would stretch about 20 feet out, 20 feet across. So they had these huge, giant wings that they used 
to soar around over the oceans looking for food. Kind of like an albatross. If you've ever heard of that bird that lives around on our planet today, an albatross uses its long wings to soar over the oceans too looking for food. And they can do that and they don't use very much energy. They can just glide on the ocean currents, on the wind that blows over the waves of the ocean. Pretty interesting. Now, pteranodon's name means toothless beak because it didn't have any teeth in its mouth. It just had a long, sharp beak that it would use for catching fish. Now, paleontologists aren't quite sure exactly how they would catch fish. Some of them think that they would just fly really low over the water and snatch a fish while they were flying and then they would fly away with it. But other paleontologists think that they could actually dive into the water, just like some birds today, called like gannet birds. They'll dive into the water and grab their fish and then swim back up to the surface where they'll eat those fish and then take off and fly off of the water again. And some paleontologists think that pteranodons would have been able to do that. What do you think? Maybe we'll have to do a little bit more investigating, a little bit more research, and find some more fossils so that we can learn more all about pteranodon. Now, when they weren't flying, they could walk around, but when they walked around, they walked around on all four of their limbs. So they walked on both of their arms and both of their legs, and they kind of stuck their arms out a little bit. Like if you've ever been to the zoo and seen a gorilla or an orangutan walking around with their arms on the ground too, their arms kind of would have stuck out a little bit with their elbows sticking out so that, and then their ring finger pointing straight up so that they wouldn't hurt or damage any of that skin that they made their wings with. Pretty interesting. Now sometimes pteranodons get confused with another type of pterosaur, the pterodactyl. Have you ever heard of that animal? So pteranodon was much, much bigger than a pterodactyl, which a lot of the animal that a lot of people have heard of before. Pterodactyls were very small, only about the size of a crow, but pteranodons were huge, enormous flying pterosaurs. And today, I brought a story about a, it's about a pterodactyl, but we're going to pretend that it's about a pteranodon. So we're going to change the word pterodactyl in our book to the word pteranodon in this story. So this story is called, Can I Bring My Pteranodon to School, Miss Johnson? by Lois G. Grambling. And it's illustrated by Judy Love. Can I bring my pterodactyl to school, Miss Johnson? Can I, please? If I brought my, pterod my pteranodon to school and our school band was on the 50-yard line during our homecoming game, playing our school song, Franklin Elementary, We Love You, and it started to rain, and our uniforms were beginning to get wet, and the tuba was filling up with water, my pteranodon could spread his wings wide and cover us all. My pteranodon would be the biggest supersized umbrella ever. Then we could finish playing all seven verses of Franklin Elementary, We Love You. Can I bring my pteranodon to school? Please, Miss Johnson, can I please? If I brought my pteranodon to school and there was a blizzard and our classroom was freezing, even though Franklin Elementary's furnace was working hard, and we were all turning blue and chattering, everyone's teeth were chattering nonstop, my pterodactyl could wrap his wings around us, all of us, around you too, Miss Johnson. Then we'd be comfy warm. My pteranodon would be the coziest, snuggliest blanket ever and we would never have to worry about freezing in a blizzard again. Can I bring my pteranodon to school, Mrs. Johnson, please? Can I please? If I brought my pteranodon to school on Valentine's Day, I wouldn't have to make a valentine for every kid in the class like I do now every year. 
because I could just get a long piece of white paper and print on it in red paint. And my pteranodon could fly it over the playground. My pteranodon would be the highest flying mail carrier ever. And all the kids in the class could look up and read it. It would be the most awesome valentine in the world. Can I bring my pteranodon to school, please, Mrs. Johnson? Can I please? If I brought my pteranodon to school, Mr. Rockbone, our science teacher, wouldn't have to take us on a field trip to the museum to study prehistoric animals like he does now. But that still sounds like a pretty fun idea, I think. Because my pteranodon would be Franklin Elementary's very own Jurassic dinosaur exhibit, even though they're not dinosaurs. My pteranodon would be the most kid-friendly animal ever, and my pteranodon wouldn't have signs on him saying, do not touch, no climbing. My pteranodon would like being touched and climbed on. Can I bring my pteranodon to school, Mrs. Johnson? Can I please? If I brought my pteranodon to school and our class won the state spelling championship this spring, which we could, maybe, we wouldn't have to drive in the school bus all the way to Washington, D.C. for the finals. Because <clears throat> my pteranodon could fly us there. My pteranodon would make the terrific first ever flying school bus then you wouldn't have to worry about any of us, especially me, turning green and getting sick on the school bus. So can I bring my pteranodon to school, Mrs. Johnson? Can I please? If I brought my pteranodon to school those last days of the school year, right before summer vacation when our room gets really hot, sticky hot, and we get really smelly, stinky smelly, especially after running on the playground, my pteranodon could flap his wings fast and be a giant fan. My pteranodon could be the coolest fan ever. And our room would get so cool, we'd probably have to put on sweaters, maybe even mittens too. But Miss Johnson, the most important reason for bringing my pteranodon to school is that is the one that counts the most is that yesterday I got this letter from Unbelievable But True Fantastic Science Fiction Magazine saying I've won second prize in their Win a Prehistoric Animal Contest. And second prize is a pteranodon. I know my mom won't let me keep a pteranodon in my room unless I'm there. Hey, wait a second. I read this letter wrong. I didn't win second prize. I won first! Oh, wow, awesome. Can I bring my woolly mammoth to school, Mrs. Johnson? Can I please? The end. That was a pretty fun story about a pteranodon, a little boy getting a pteranodon and wanting to bring it to school, wasn't it? Well, we've got some questions you've been asking us during our broadcast today, and we're gonna answer some of those while we make our craft today. So today, we're going to be making a, ter a pterosaur, a pterosaur flying mobile. So I've got this page that you'll be able to download from our website. Um, after a little bit after Munchkins, a little bit later today, um, that you can print out and color and do this activity with us. So I've got my scissors and my printout. I've got a hole punch and some straws, two straws, and some colored pencils to color with, and some string and a paper clip, and that's what I'm gonna to need to make my activity today. So the first thing I'm going to do is color my pterosaur. So I'm gonna pour out my colored pencils here so that I can color these pterosaurs. Now on my pterosaur sheet, I've got four different pterosaurs. I've got a Quetzalcoatlus. I've got a Pteranodon. I've got a Ramphorhynchus and a tapajara. So those are four different types of pteranodons from all over the world. And while we color these animals in, let's answer some questions. So, Ollie would like to know if they build nests with sticks like birds do now. That is a very good question, Ollie. So we aren't really sure 
what pteranodons would have built their nests with. So we know that they usually probably nested near or on the tops of cliffs overlooking the ocean, or they would have just nested sort of near the ocean, um, since that's where they like to get that's where they like to get their food from. Um, and lots of animals who nest near the ocean now, some of them use sticks to make their nests. Some of them just make their nests right on the rock. So we're not entirely sure what a pteranodon might have made its nest with, um, but maybe one day a paleontologist will go out looking for pterosaurs, looking for pteranodons, and they'll find a pteranodon nest. That would be pretty interesting, I think, if they found a nest of a pteranodon. And then we could answer that question about what they made their nests with. Very good question. All right, so I'm coloring my pteranodon, and this one's gonna be kind of, I'm gonna give it kind of a grayish colored body with orange wings and an orange and red crest on the top of its head. So pteranodon, just like lots of other pterosaurs, had what we call a crest on the top of their head. And a crest is kind of like, if you think about, if you can imagine a rooster, roosters have sort of a big, sort of a uh, big thing on the top of their head called their comb, but that's another, that's just a type of crest that's on the top of their head. So animals, some animals have crests on their head to help them find each other or see other types of animals that are the same type of animal as them. They'll go, oh, I see that that animal has a crest. That must be an animal just like me, uh, a pteranodon or a rooster, or even like the one I'm coloring right now, a Quetzalcoatlus. So lots of animals have crests. There's lots of dinosaurs who have, that have crests too, and a lot of pterosaurs that have crests. All right, while we're coloring this, let's answer another question. So Noel wants to know if they are dinosaurs. They are not dinosaurs. That's a good question though, Noel. So dinosaurs are their own group of animals. And dinosaurs um, have a couple things about their bodies that make them very different than pterosaurs. And the biggest one, or one of the biggest ones, is that their legs go straight down underneath their bodies. So if you stand up, and you stand up and your legs, you'll see your legs go straight down underneath your body, just like my legs go straight down underneath my body, or a cow's legs go straight down underneath their body, or a dog's legs go straight down. That's how dinosaurs and animals like us mammals walk, but pterosaurs and other reptiles, they walk with their legs more out to the side like this. So when they walk, their bodies kind of make an S shape back and forth. So if you ever see like an alligator walking along, you'll see what I mean, sort of like they kind of make like an S shape with their bodies as they walk. All right, I'm just coloring in this really, really big one called Quetzalcoatlus. Quetzalcoatlus is one of the biggest pterosaurs that we've ever found. It's had a wingspan of about 45 feet. So it was a really, really huge pterosaur. And I'm coloring one of my favorite ones called a Tapajara. And Tapajara was a, a pterosaur that lived down in Brazil, in South America. And I'm making it some really bright, fun colors. So some of them, sometimes when I color animals, I like to color them kind of colors I think they might really be out in nature. And other times I like to make them really colorful. And the fun thing about animals like pterosaurs and even some dinosaurs is that we don't really know what colors they were. So it's up to our imaginations to decide what we want them to look like. And then I think I'm gonna make this Rampharynchus kind of like a, like a brownish color. And maybe I'll even give it some spots or some stripes. I think that might be fun. 
while we color this and let's answer another question. So Oliver and Henry would like to know how fast they can fly. That's a good question. So pterosaurs, including Pteranodon, were not especially well known for, their, for being really fast. They were animals that could, they could flap their wings and fly around um, a little bit, but they really relied on being able to soar, to soar and glide over the ocean, over the water, over the land where they were living. So they weren't particularly fast animals. So they only few, flew a few miles an hour, not very fast, um, and they just would glide. So they didn't really flap their wings very much. If they needed to, they could flap their wings to get off the ground or to fly up out of the water like some paleontologists think that they could or to take off um, from a cliff. They could flap their wings or if there wasn't very much wind, they could flap their wings a little bit to help them fly. But for the most part, they held their wings straight out and they would just glide around. So about as fast as the air could carry them, that's about how fast they would go. All right, I've got all of my pterosaurs colored now, and I'm gonna use my scissors, and I'm going to cut out around their wings and their bodies so I can turn them into a little mobile I can hang up in, maybe I'll hang it up in my office. That sounds like a good place to hang up this mobile. Have you ever seen a mobile before? Maybe you have a little brother or sister and they have a mobile that hangs above their crib with little animals on it. So a lot of times babies like looking at mobiles. They like things hanging above them so that they can see them and they like to observe them. That's a very sciencey, scientist thing to do, to observe things in your surroundings. A lot of people think about babies as being scientists, but scientists are just people who like to ask questions about the world around them and learn more about it. So if you like to ask questions, I know, which I know some of you do because you've sent me some questions to answer while you watch our show, you're a scientist too. So, and it's really fun to be a scientist, I think. Right. I cut out the really big one. Hopefully the other ones don't take me very long to cut out. While I cut these out too, let's answer another question. So L would like to know what color pteranodons were. That's a good question, L. So like we said, we don't know exactly what color pteranodons were because we don't find the parts of their body that would have had color like their pycno fibers or their skin, it just doesn't preserve, the fossils don't preserve that information for us. So we can't see what color they were just from looking at their bones. So until we find a really well-preserved one that maybe has some um, color in their pycno fibers still, um, we'll never know exactly what color um, some of these animals that lived a long, long time ago, what color they really actually looked like. There are some animals we can tell, like there's a really cool dinosaur at our Dinosaur Discovery Museum called Cynoceropteryx. And it was so well preserved with the little tiny feathers that we could see inside the feathers and see it's pigments. Those are little tiny molecules inside the feathers that are what give them their color. And so since the, the fossil was so well preserved and we could see those pigments inside their feathers, we know that Cynoceropteryx's body was covered with dark brown or black feathers and it had a black and white striped tail. Pretty interesting, I think. All right, I've just got to cut out my Rampharynchus here, and then we'll be all ready to assemble our mobile. We've got them all 
One, two, and three. Screw around three little corners there to finish cutting out my Rampharynchus. All right, now I'm gonna take my hole punch and you'll see on all of my pterosaurs, there's a little circle. That's where I'm going to punch out so I can tie a string to each of my pterosaurs that I'm gonna hang up. And punch this one. Punch a hole in my Pteranodon. And one more in my Quetzalcoatlus. Quetzalcoatlus was a really big pterosaur. They almost looked like, if you can imagine, a giraffe with wings. They were about 18 feet tall when they were on the ground with a really long neck and a beak that was about six feet long. That's about as long as I am tall. A huge giant beak. And I'm also on my Quetzalcoatlus and my Pteranodon. There's a little line down the middle of their body that I'm just gonna cut just to the end of the line, not all the way through, so that, and I'm gonna do it on the wings and on the head so I can slide them together just like this. Pretty cool, huh? It's almost like a 3D Pteranodon then. All right. And now I'm gonna need a couple pieces of string. I'm gonna need one piece of string for each of my pterosaurs. So I have one, two, three, four. So I'm going to need four pieces of string. So I'm gonna cut kind of, I think, one big piece, and then I'm gonna cut that into smaller pieces because I don't need any of my pieces of string to be very long. And now I've got two. And if I cut it in half again, now I've got four pieces of string. Perfect. So I'm going to tie one string to each of my pteranodons through that little hole that I punched. Are you learning to tie yet? To tie your shoes? So sometimes, right now we're learning, maybe you learn how to tie our shoes and we'll find that a little difficult. It can be hard to learn how to tie your shoes. And it takes a lot of practice to learn how to tie and to learn how to tie things quickly. But once you get it, it's worth it and you can you use it a lot. I bet if you told me when I was a little boy that I needed to learn how to tie my shoes so that later I could make a Pteranodon mobile as part of my job, I don't know if I would have believed you. All right, I've just got two more that I need to tie. All right, there we go. Now what you could do is you could tie each of those strings to the ends of each of your, uh, your straws, but I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna try something a little bit different. I'm gonna try taking my scissors, and you might need help with this part, and I'm gonna cut a little slit in the end of each of my straws, in each end of my straws, very carefully. So then I can just slide the string in that little slit, and if I need to make more pteranodons or more pterosaurs, then I can, I can take those off or I can replace them. And then I'm gonna take my paper clip and I'm gonna open it up like this so it kind of makes an S shape just like this. And then I'm gonna push one end of the, the paper clip through the middle of my straw, which I think you'll need a, adult's help for this part because it can be a little bit hard to do that. And I'm gonna make it so that my straws make kind of an X shape. So an X looks like two lines crossing over each other, just like that. And now I can slide my strings in between the straws in those little slits that I made. And since these pterosaurs aren't very heavy, they should just be able to hold, the string should be able to hold them in there. And voila, look at that. Those pterosaurs flying around. So cool. So 
So hopefully you have fun making that art project. And thank you guys so much for coming and joining to us today to learn all about Pteranodon and some other pterosaurs too. We hope that we, you join us next week when we learn all about cicadas. All right, thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.